would point out that um, last fall, um, Aaron was a finalist in the student paper competition at the American Medical Informatics Association meeting. Um, and um, he also continues to uh, work with colleagues in um, ophthalmology, studying retinopathy of prematurity, um, including Dr. Chang. So for those of you who don't know or don't remember, um, the process will be that um, um, Aaron will um, give his talk. Um, we'll then open it up to questions from uh, whoever is here. Um, when those questions are done, the public will leave and will leave behind his committee uh, to ask him any further questions. Um, and then the committee will ask him to leave and make a decision whether or not he has successfully defended his, thesis, his dissertation. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. All right. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your day to come attend my dissertation defense, which, as the name implies here, is going to be around machine learning and how we can use that to solve some problems in this disease called retinopathy of prematurity. And before I get started, um, I would just like to make some quick acknowledgments uh, if I didn't do any of this on my own. Uh, first, to my dissertation advisory committee for all the research help and planning and execution that they provided. Um, the IROP consortium for collecting all of the data that I'm using in this study, um, especially Susan Osmo for helping to organize that data and then you know, distribute it to me. Um, to the DMICE faculty, staff, and students for all the training and support they provided. And then of course, the National Library of Medicine for the funding that they provided to me over these past four and a half years. So, Retinopathy of prematurity, or ROP, um, is a disease of the retinal vasculature that affects premature infants who are born prior to 31 weeks of gestation and who weigh less than 1,501 grams at birth. And it's one of the leading causes of childhood blindness in both developing countries and developed countries. So the retina is that light sensitive tissue that's on the back of the eye that allows you to actually see. And there's three major features here. So the first is the macula, which is this densely populated, populated area of cone photoreceptors. And your cones are responsible for allowing you to see in color vision, um, but also because they're so densely packed in this one area, they also provide humans with high visual acuity. We also have the optic disc, which collects light information from all the various cone photoreceptors or all of the various photoreceptors in the eye and then transmits them to the brain for visual processing. And then we have the retinal blood vessels, which are here to provide oxygen and nutrients to those photoreceptor cells and other supporting cells of the eye. Um, so you can imagine that if you had any sort of disruption to any three of these major features that could disrupt your visual acuity and potentially cause blindness. Now, normally about 16 weeks after a baby is conceived, the retinal blood vessels begin to form. And then between 26 and 30 weeks, the eye really begins to develop at an increased pace. And then finally, the baby is born sometime between 38 and 42 weeks. But if a baby is born extremely prematurely, the eye never has a chance to develop at that increased pace. So a lot of it is left underdeveloped. But there are many other organs in the body that are also underdeveloped. And one of the most critical ones is the lungs. So to make sure that we can keep a baby alive, we supply them with supplemental oxygen. But this has the negative effect of inhibiting the growth of the retinal vasculature. And that's because normally the maternal womb is actually hypoxic. And this drives the, retina, the retinal vasculature to start growing towards the peripheral retina so that more photoreceptor cells can form there. Um, but when we you know, put them in this extra oxygen, they no longer feel the need to start growing like that anymore. But once the baby's returned back to room air, those undeveloped areas of the retina become hypoxic once again, and the retinal vasculature starts to grow in an uncontrolled manner towards those areas to provide those oxygen and nutrients. But those retinal blood vessels that form are extremely weak and fragile, so eventually what happens is they end up rupturing, they bleed into the eye, and then they scar over. But the scar itself anchors the retina to the, that particular portion in the back of the eye. And as the eye continues to grow, the scar pulls on the retina and can cause it to detach from the back of the eye and can cause either a partial retinal detachment or a complete retinal detachment. 
and this can com cause complete blindness. Now, to start looking for the presence of this uncontrolled retinal vasculature, physicians are really looking for the presence of plus disease, um, which is described as venous dilation and arterial tortuosity. And you can see that what plus disease, what the retinal blood vessels look like compared to an eye with normal vasculature over here. And then we also have this kind of in-between condition known as pre-plus disease, which just describes vasculature that's not, that's, you know, not normal. It's abnormal looking, but it's not yet severe enough to be considered plus disease. And what's critical about this is that all of these, these pre, this normal pre-plus plus disease kind of spectrum here is tightly correlated to the need for treatment for ROP. So babies who have plus disease almost always get treated for ROP. Some babies who develop pre-plus disease will eventually develop plus disease and need treatment or have self-regressing, um, you know, ROP. And then the normal vasculature babies never really need to be treated. So to make sure that we're catching all cases of plus disease, we have highly sensitive screening guidelines. And these um, screenings begin as early as 31 weeks of postmenstrual age. And the follow-up is based on the severity of that retinal vasculature. Um, so we can have a follow-up that occurs, you know, less than one week up to three weeks. And then a baby is discharged when there's um, only when there's unequivocally regressing ROP. But the downside to these highly sensitive screening guidelines, where we're just screening all babies who weigh, you know, less than 1,501 grams and who are born prior to 31 weeks of gestation, is that they have very poor specificity. So roughly 85 to 90 percent of the babies that we do screen for ROP never develop treatment requiring ROP. And this is not great because these exams are physiologically stressful and we're adding, we're increasing the screening burden that's placed on an already limited number of ROP specialists. And then finally, many of these exams like have to be performed in person. So getting care into uh, rural areas and developing, com in developing countries is very difficult. So to kind of start to get care into those areas, uh, physicians and researchers have tried to implement methods such as telemedicine, um, where we can increase the geographic area in which experts can provide care and thus increase the total number of infants who are screened for ROP. But there are, again, some negative consequences associated with that. So the first is that the required exam frequency for telemedicine is about once a week. Um, we can't be stretching out we're not allowed to stretch out these exams to three weeks. Um, so that increases the physiological stress for all of these babies, you know, who are screened via telemedicine because of this required exam frequency. Um, it also increases that physician screening burden because now we're, you know, uh, we're examining more babies and there has to be someone else on the other end of this pipeline to read these images and provide a diagnosis. And then finally, there's an issue of having reduced accuracy and reliability um, when low quality retinal images are provided. So if a low quality image comes through, it's possible that a physician could misdiagnose a treatment requiring baby as non-treatment requiring, or um, the physician might not feel comfortable making a diagnosis. So they say, hey, you need to bring that baby back in for another um, screening examination, which again is physiologically stressful. Now, we have seen some automated methods for the diagnosis of ROP coming in, um, and these do help to reduce that physician screening burden, but they still have some of those same negative um, consequences associated with them. Namely, you know, there's a still that required exam frequency and the reduced accuracy and reliability with low quality images. So if we try to kind of sum this up, what we can see is that there are three major needs here. The first is that we need, have a need for automated image quality assessment for retinal fundus images. We need to find a way to reduce the physiological stress that's placed on these babies. And we also need to find a way to reduce that ROP specialist screening burden. And to solve these, we're gonna use three specific aims. So in the first specific aim, we're gonna build a convolutional neural network that can discriminate between acceptable and non-acceptable quality images. In the second aim, we're gonna build a risk model for treatment requiring ROP patients that can perform better than the current birth weight and gestational age model. So that way we can at least um, increase our specificity and not have to screen some, so much of the population so often. And then finally, we wanna to try to reduce that ROP specialist screening burden by developing personalized reference standard images 
um, of plus disease so that some, so that our non RLP specialists can, um, can screen the, uh, less, less, uh, the lower risk, uh, the lower risk RLP babies. And this could be someone who's, you know, maybe not an RLP specialist, but still qualified to perform exams, someone like an ophthalmic or a pediatric ophthalmologist. And to do all of this, we're going to use a data set that's been collected by the Imaging and Informatics and Retinopathy of Prematurity Consortium. Kind of a mouthful, kind of a mouthful, so I'm just going to say the IROP data set here. Um, and this is a data set that has over 950 subjects that have been collected from nine North American study centers. And there are over 32,000 uh, retinal fundus images in here of different views of the eye. And there are clinical factors for every baby in here. And importantly, every exam for every baby has an expert consensus diagnosis of plus disease and various other um, aspects of the disease um, that's been formed by six or more expert ROP graders. So aim one is the quality control for retinal fundus images. And up here, I just have some images that have been determined to be acceptable, possibly acceptable, or not of not acceptable quality for the diagnosis of ROP as determined by um, a consensus of ROP experts. And you can see, it seems like you might be able to use some pretty basic image quality metrics to, uh, to figure out the difference between acceptable, possibly acceptable, and not acceptable images. You could use, it looks like you could use like a brightness contrast metric here to see the difference. Um, but the problem here is that these are some really nice cherry picked examples that I've pulled out for you. Um, and when you look at some real world examples, the difference between these categories is far less stark. Um, so in an acceptable quality image, what I see is that, you know, you can see, even though all of these images are hazy, you can still see the retinal vasculature extending into the peripheral retina, whereas you start to lose that on these lower quality images. So we need a model that isn't looking at necessarily the global information of this, um, of these images, but rather these, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these, these finer details of the images. So that's why we're going to use um, a model called the convolutional neural network, which is really great for um, being able to classify images. And the one we're going to use is called In Inception V3, which was developed by Google, and it's been trained on the ImageNet database. And that's important because the ImageNet database contains about 14 million images from thousands of different categories. So it has images of cats and airplanes and dishwashers and all sorts of different things. And importantly, what that means is that in the first layers here, or these, you know, these first layers, it's learned, this model has learned what basic shapes look like. So it's learned, you know, how to identify what a circle looks like, what a um, triangle, square, all those things look like. And then in these later layers, it learns specific combinations of those features um, and how they correlate to each of these different image classifications. So it might, you know, here in these layers, we might learn what an almond shape looks like in a triangle. And then these later layers, it learns, well, if you have two almond shapes together and then an upside down triangle below it, it might be a cat, right? So we can use this model and harness it and leverage it for our specific use case. Um, and what we can do is freeze these early layers that have learned these basic shapes and then fine tune these later layers for our specific use case, which is going to be to classify images as, as either acceptable quality or as possibly acceptable or not acceptable quality. So we're gonna make this into a binary classification task. And we're going to do this, we're going to just split our data into the canonical, you know, 80-20 training test data sets there. And we're gonna perform five-fold cross-validation. And importantly, there is an overlap in subjects, um, subject size between our training and test data sets. And what we found through five-fold cross-validation is that the AUCs range from about 0 0.953 up to 0 0.965. So this suggests that the model is performing pretty well, or each of these individual models are performing pretty well, and they don't seem to be overfitting to the data and that they should generalize well. So to further test that generalizability, um, we took the best performing model, which was model one with the AUC of 0 0.965, and evaluated it on our held out test data set. And again, it performed with an AUC of 0 0.965. So this suggests that this model um, does generalize very well. It should work 
pretty well on similar samples from the same population that it's been trained on. Now, importantly, this model has also been trained, it, we should keep in mind that this model has been trained on um, labels that were determined by a physician's ability to diagnose images for telemedicine purposes. Um, but it might be that we want to use this model, you know, for uh, other methods such as, you know, like the automated methods that I was kind of previously talking about. And those methods might require images to be more, um, be of higher quality, or it might be able to get away with lesser quality images. So to see if this model, if we could confidently adjust that threshold at which we're binning images as acceptable or, or not acceptable, um, we had physicians first um, take a subset of 30 images from the test data set. Uh, and we had them perform pairwise comparisons on these images as basically asking them which of these images, of these two images, which is of better quality. And after performing so many comparisons, we were able to develop a ranking of the images for each individual expert. And then from that, we're able to create an expert consensus ranking. And then we also took those same 30 images and fed them through the model. And then rather than having the model provide us with a classification of the image of being, you know, either acceptable quality or not acceptable quality, we had to provide us with the probability of an image belonging to the acceptable quality class. And then with those probabilities, we just ordered the images or formed a rank for them um, based off of that probability ranging from zero to one. And what we found was that first, experts were highly correlated with one another in terms of their ranking of image quality. So their Spearman's rank correlation ranged from 0 0.89 up to 0 0.97. But if we look at how the model um, compared with individual experts, we see that its rank correlation ranged from 0 0.86 up to 0 0.93. And then just to further confirm this, um, the CNN still uh, correlated very highly with the with a consensus ranking here. So this suggests that this model can not only, you know, uh, classify images acceptable or not acceptable, but that we should be able to, um, you know, tune that decision threshold for whatever specific use case we want to use this in. Now, one major limitation of this study um, is kind of centered around the population that we used for this. Um, and that is the fact that this is a North American data set and that retinal pigmentation is highly correlated with race. Um, so this model contains basically a bunch of white babies in it. Um, and there are some severely underrepresented groups in this data set. So if we were going to be using this model for um, some of those underrepresented groups, we, it either needs to be, you know, kind of taken with a grain of salt, or ideally if you could retrain a model, um, you know, on a data set that was made up of mostly those underrepresented groups, that would be great. So key takeaways here are that we can detect acceptable quality images from those which are not, and we can adjust that threshold fairly confidently um, for whatever potential application we want to use this for, whether that be for, you know, um, quality assurance for imaging technicians. Basically, the, we could implement this right at the bedside, right at the point of care, so that the second an image was taken, someone could be alerted as to whether or not that image was the, of acceptable quality. But it could also be used in telemedicine or automated disease diagnosis pipelines. And in fact, we're currently kind of working out some kinks and trying to get this into our IROP DL system, which is an automated method for uh, plus disease detection. But this also has bigger implications too. Um, this can be used for other ophthalmic eye diseases. Um, it can be used for ophthalmic eye diseases that use different imaging modalities, or it could just be used for entirely different diseases and imaging modalities. Now in AIM-2, our goal is going to be to predict which children will develop treatment requiring RLP better than the current birth weight and gestational age model that we use. And before we start doing that, we really need to think about what factors are gonna to contribute to physician acceptance and the clinical implementation of this model. And the three that we've kind of identified here are performance, transparency, and ease of use. So this model needs to be, needs to have high performance. And by that, we need a model that's going to have extremely high sensitivity. Because remember the cost of an incorrect prediction here is gonna be lifelong visual impairment. But 
for this model to also be practical, it also has to have high specificity. Um, so remember, we have a model right now that has very low set specificity. So even having something above 50% would be ideal. This model also needs to be transparent, meaning it needs to be highly interpretable by physicians. So what comes to mind instantly is just something like a simple linear model. And since this is a classification task, we'll do logistic regression. Um, but we can use some tools to kind of boost the performance of this, um, you know, namely using elastic net regularization, class weighting, and then we can tune that decision threshold to be a little bit more sensitive for our cases here. And then finally, this model also needs to be easy to use. Um, it needs to have a limited number of predictors. We can't have something with, you know, 50 or 60 predictors because we want this model to be able to be used right at the bedside. And these predictors need to be common among all babies and easy to acquire. It can't be something where you have to send something out to a lab and wait. Uh, we want it to be able to, you know, be pretty instantaneous. So if we look at a whole list of potential predictors, there are many in here. But if we start looking through which ones are common among all babies, we can start to narrow it down. And then if we look at which ones are easy to measure, we really get, um, we really find that like birth weight, gestational age, and as of late, vascular severity are um, easier to measure. And vascular severity hasn't been included in any risk models um, to date, and that's for a particular reason. So here I have an image um, or a figure from uh, a paper by Dr. Campbell. Um, and what you see here is we have each of these rectangles representing an image here along the x-axis. And the color of these rectangles represents the diagnosis that this image was given. And then on the y-axis, we have a reference standard diagnosis and then eight individual ROP experts. So if you look at expert eight, for instance, they say, well, all of these images here are images of plus disease, but the reference standard says, well, actually, these images that you said were plus disease are only pre-plus disease. And then you contrast that with expert one, who says only these images are plus disease and the rest are pre-plus, even though the RSD says, well, these images are also plus disease. So you have this issue of inter-expert disagreement. You have some people who are over colors of disease and some people who are under colors of disease. And you can't really use that in a model because their diagnosis is so squishy here. And a huge reason why it's so squishy is because we try to bin this vascular severity, essentially, into three different categories of normal, pre-plus, and plus disease. But ideally, this whole vascular severity is actually a continuous spectrum. Um, you know, it's, it's not that there are three different categories. It should be this continuous uh, line here. And so we can form a, a, um, a vascular severity score and... Uh, some people in our lab have actually done that. So a uh, postdoc in our lab, James Brown, uh, not the singer artist, but a great guy still, uh, he um, built a model where you can take a retinal fundus image and you can convert that into a retinal vessel map um, by segmenting it with a unit. That, if that vessel map is then sent into the IROP DL system, which is here to classify plus disease. The IROP DL system eventually um, spits out what's called a soft max layer. So this will give a probability of that image being normal, pre plus, and plus. And importantly, all of these um, probabilities must sum to one. And then whichever of these has the maximum probability um, receives the diagnosis. So if there's a probability of 90% here and normal, then the image is called normal. But Dr. Campbell came up with an idea where you can make a continuous spectrum here if you take the probability of that image being normal, add that to five times the probability of that image being pre-plus and nine times that um, probability of that image being plus. So if you have an image that is, you know, 100% a plus disease image, it's gonna have a vascular severity score of nine. If it's 100% normal, it's gonna have a vascular severity score of one and everything in between will fall somewhere in between one and nine. And so he further followed up on this and just examine a set of images, um, you know, a larger set of images. And what you find is that the vascular severity score does seem, um, the, I guess the, the, uh, the vascular severity score that we've seen does seem to correlate very highly with actual vascular severity. And then another physician, Dr. Taylor, um, did an interesting study where he looked at the vascular severity score 
between children who developed treatment requiring RLP and those who did not, and looked at their vascular severity scores over time. And what you find is that the babies who have, who eventually develop treatment requiring RLP start to have this diverging vascular severity score starting as early as 32 weeks of postmenstrual age. But what's important to note here is that this vascular severity score, the median score here, is about 1.5, which is not cause for alarm um, for any physician there. They're going to say, this baby looks normal to me, um, but, but it's actually starting to diverge here. And importantly, this diverging vascular severity score begins about a month before the actual treatment requiring RLP diagnosis comes through. So that means that this might be a really great predictor of um, the need for treatment in the future. So to do this, we again split our data set into those, you know, the training test data sets with the 80-20 split here, and we still perform five-fold cross-validation. Um, we are going to say that all images that are used here have to be of acceptable quality because those are the, because they're going to go through this IROP DL system here. And then we're going to look at that first exam, at least for our training set, we're going to look at that first exam to occur between the 32 and 34 weeks postmenstrual age. But then for our test data set, we're going to open it up a bit and say, well, any baby that comes in after 32 weeks will use this model. So if you're coming in at 35 weeks, we're not going to turn you away. And then to make this model more predictive in nature rather than diagnostic, we're going to say that for babies in the training data set, that treatment requiring RLP diagnosis has to occur at least seven or more days from that initial exam to occur between 32 and 34 weeks. And that's because we want this model to be very sensitive to those um, slight changes in vascular severity um, rather than just picking up on a baby who has treatment requiring RLP when they come in. But of course, in the real world, we're not going to know when a baby is going to develop treatment requiring ROP, or even if they will. Um, so we're going to say, you can come in and you can have treatment requiring ROP, um, and let's hope that our model will actually catch that disease. So when we just evaluate the univariate predictors here and see how well they performed on these um, on our, in our training set with fivefold cross-validation, we see that the area under the precision recall curve is about 0.29. And the area under the precision recall curve is going to be our main metric of model performance here. And that's because this is such an imbalanced data set. So a null model would actually have an area under the precision recall of about 0.1. So when we see something 0.29, that's actually fairly predictive. And then when we look at all possible combinations of just these three basic um, predictors here, we find that a combination of gestational age and vascular severity has the highest area under the precision recall curve of 0.35. Now, we wanted to make sure that this model was, again, highly sensitive. So during the training phase, uh, we made the class weights inversely proportional to the class frequencies. And that's so basically, um, you know, so if I, if the model um, incorrectly predicted that a treatment requiring baby would not develop um, treatment requiring disease, then it was uh, penalized more heavily than if the, in, the reverse happened there. But we can also tune the decision threshold here. And to do that, we're going to use the F beta score. Um, and we can set beta, we can increase beta to increase um, our weighting um, of, 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 of or sorry, we can, so we can prioritize our minimization of false negatives over false positives. And we want to do that because our potential cost of a wrong prediction, again, is lifelong visual impairment here. So to strongly prioritize that minima minimization, we set beta equal to four. Um, and we're hoping that this will, you know, catch all babies who have treatment requiring disease and still have a relatively high uh, specificity here. And when we did that, we found that that threshold uh, occurred, the maximum threshold, or sorry, the maximum F score, F4 score score occurred at a threshold of 0 0.33. So when we evaluate this model on our held out test data set, again, of subjects this model's never seen before, it identified 100% or 132 of the eyes that developed treatment requiring our ROP and didn't miss a single one. And importantly, it had a specificity of 
Now, we also wanted to evaluate how this model will perform on an independent test data, test data set. Um, so we collected, we kind of have one that was been collected from a hospital in Salem, Oregon, and it's much smaller. Um, but again, it was able to identify all eyes that develop treatment requiring RLP and still was able to rule out this time, you know, over 50% and near 60% of the eyes that would never develop treatment requiring RLP. And what's really cool about this is that we're identifying these babies, um, you know, somewhere between 3.4 and 3.7 weeks um, before um, this diagnosis actually occurs. So that means that we can really start to tell our RLP specialists, hey, these are the babies you need to focus on, and these other ones are going to be less worrisome. So again, uh, just kind of key takeaways here. For RLP, we built a model that we can identify you know, all babies that will develop treatment requiring RLP, just as the current birth weight gestational age model. But importantly, we can reduce that RLP screening burden in the associated physiological stress by more than 50%. And this is huge um, because this currently outperforms other RLP risk models. Um, and we've shown that this is working on a pretty diverse, you know, large data set here um, collected from all over North America. Um, now, our future work is going to kind of aim at these validation studies. We're still going to start to collect data from those Salem, Oregon, that Salem, Oregon hospital. Um, and we'd like to try to get our hands on a larger, another large North American cohort study here. It is proving a little bit difficult because many of those larger ROP data sets don't also include associated imaging data. Um, so that's just one challenge. Um, but we are looking at other methods, if we can further improve specificity, especially of those who've been, you know, you know, uh, so if we die, or if we predict the baby's going to develop treatment requiring RLP, can we further, you know, improve specificity? And we're looking at methods like, um, you know, maybe looking at the oxygen exposure that they've had since birth, because that can play a role here. Um, and then finally, another limitation here is just regarding the population that this model's been trained on. Um, we actually have data su to suggest that the Vascular severity score isn't affected by the or by which population, and that's because those retinal fundus images are first converted into retinal vessel maps. Um, so that kind of removes that that pigmentation and the associated race data there. Um, but there are differences in differences in gestational age and differences between which babies develop treatment requiring um, RLP um, and their gestational age. So we find that in developing countries, often the babies who develop that disease can be older and larger than what we see in developed countries. Now, in the final aim, our goal here is going to be going to be to develop personalized reference standard images. Um, again, so that we, well, I guess here I'll explain. Uh, so the reason that we want to do this is that we have a model now that can predict which babies will, will are likely to develop treatment requiring ROP. And then also filter out a bunch of babies who we don't think will develop treatment requiring RLP. But we can't just say, well, we're never going to examine these babies again. Um, I think the better thing to think here is that they aren't no risk of treatment requiring RLP. They're just low risk. So those low risk babies could instead be examined again by like someone like a pediatric ophthalmologist while we have our RLP specialists focus on these children who are predicted to develop treatment requiring RLP. And to do this, we're going to, you know, help them diagnose using these, uh, these personalized reference standard images. And there is a current um, reference standard image for PLUS disease, um, but it has some associated problems. And the, the first thing is that it's about 40 years old, so the, the camera technology at the time is really the main problem here. And when you look at these images, uh, you can, it looks like the amount of uh, dilation and tortuosity that's required for a PLUS disease image is much higher than what we see on this image here. So this image on the right is an image that has an expert consensus diagnosis of plus disease. And this image looks far less severe than this image, but really it's still plus disease. So to do this, uh, we're gonna have a model. We're going to take a patient's image and we're gonna use that, that previously trained UNET model um, to develop a retinal vessel map. But then we're gonna use a generative adversarial network to modify that retinal vessel map to look like, to instead of looking like normal, um, to look like it has plus disease, while still keeping the same, the same backbone and structure here. 
And then we're going to use another generative adversarial network or a GAN to convert that vessel map into a realistic looking um, retinal fundus image here. So just for a little bit of background, a GAN is basically two convolutional neural networks that are pitted against one another. And one is a discriminator. Um, and the discriminator is kind of like the, the image quality one that I built earlier, where it's just, you know, trying to tell the difference between data that's real and data that's fake. And then we have the generator, which its job is to generate data. So it's going to make fake data. And the, the discriminator is fed real and fake data after the generator creates its fake data. And then it makes its, um, you know, guesses on what the images are. And then it, the loss statistics from that model are output back to the generator. And the generator updates um, its weight. So it's starting to learn what it's doing right and what it's doing wrong. And what we hope is that we get to a point where the generator can create data that's so realistic looking that the discriminator calls it real. So in the first half of this aim, our goal is going to be to convert retinal vessel maps into those retinal fundus images. Um, and we're gonna to try to tackle this first because there's really no point in us being able to convert between a normal and plus disease vessel map if we can't even get that vessel map back into a usable image for a position. So what we're gonna use here is called a paired image uh, GAN. And basically the paired image GAN requires that you have a label and an associated output like this. And you can see why our, um, this is a great use case for us because we have this label of this vessel map in the associated output. So when we pull kind of an off the shelf model and feed our retinal images or our vessel maps through there, we find that we can actually generate some fairly realistic looking um, retinal fundus images here. If we look closely, you can see the presence of these smaller blood vessels and these are called choroidal blood vessels. And these patterns shouldn't be, shouldn't exist in here because the idea of our, um, of these vessel maps is that they contain only the main arteries and veins. But after some investigation, I found that some very low level pixel information that you can't see with the naked eye um, actually contains information about these choroidal blood vessel patterns. So I filtered those out and then retrained this GAN. And what we find is that um, we can still recreate these images and without those choroidal blood vessel patterns, but the image quality seems to suffer a little bit. And if we measure that using the structural similarity index measure or the SSIM, um, we see that it does, that does seem to be the case here. And the SSIM is ideal um, because it's not only looking, you know, between, it's not, it, it basically uses whatever image you have, this generated image, and it's comparing it to this reference image. Um, and it's not looking only at just the, you know, the color and brightness contrast and similarities, but it's also looking at the local structure of these images, which was really helpful for identifying, you know, making sure that the actual retinal blood vessels are, have the same pattern. And when we ask our experts, can they detect the difference between real and generated images, uh, they were able to do so pretty easily. But what we really care about is, can you diagnose these images? And when we sent, had them evaluate just a subset of our test data set here, um, we can see that there are diagnoses between real images and, um, and generated images, whether or not they had choroidal blood vessel patterns present, seem to be pretty similar. And we can evaluate this using the Cochrane mantle hansel test, which suggests that these conting contingency tables are um, not statistically different from one another. And if we also compare the experts' diagnoses um, together, the weighted Cohen's kappa metric also says that there's near perfect agreement between experts' um, uh, diagnoses of real images compared to generated images, um, again, whether or not they had choroidal blood vessel patterns present. But we wanted to see now, so now that we know that experts can, you know, reliably diagnose these images and they see, you know, they have a fairly high uh, structural similarity index measure and they're still receiving the same diagnoses. We wanted to see if we could, you know, trick the experts into this, at this point, into believing these images were real. Um, so I used a much higher capacity GAN this time, and it took uh, quite a few days to train here. But eventually I was able to create um, 
retinal fundus images or generate retinal fundus images from retinal vessel maps um, that look very realistic. And they, they um, rather than being a size of 256 by 256, they're now the actual size of a real retinal fundus image. So they look like they're very high quality. And what's kind of cool is that this model, even though it doesn't, this model was trained on those vessel maps that don't have the choroidal blood vessel patterns, but it still attempts to input some of them to make them look more realistic. And when we look at the structural similarity index measure here, we see that it's nearly double that of these images that, um, that, that, what am I trying to say? It's nearly double that of these images that didn't have the choroidal blood vessel patterns. So it suggests that these images should be just as diagnosable um, as these, as these uh, lesser quality images. And these images were not statistically, you know, different in their diagnoses from real images. But what we did want to know was, could experts identify images that were generated here um, by the sewer model? So we had a set of four new experts who weren't at all, had no idea what the study was about, um, and just asked them to look at 50 real images and 50 generated images and tried to pick out which ones were real and which ones were fake. And what we found is that they pretty much were not able to do so. Um, there was one expert, expert four, who could tell the difference between um, between real and fake images, but most of them were not. And the expert majority uh, classification here was again um, not statistically significant. So key takeaways here is that we can develop or generate these synthetic retinal images that are highly realistic and hard for even experts to identify. And what's most important is that they are structurally similar to um, their real image counterparts. And that was evident both by the structural similarity index measure and the fact that they received the same diagnoses as their real image counterparts. Now, the second half of this aim was just to augment the vascular severity of those retinal vessel maps um, so that we can make them look more like plus disease. And for that, we're going to use what's called an unpaired image GAN. So in the previous GAN, we had, you know, a label and associated output. Here, we just know that we have, you know, an image that looks like something and we want it to go to like another modality, essentially. So we have an image that goes from, you know, either a painting by Monet to a real image or a picture of a zebra that we want to convert to a horse. So for us, we're going to try to take this image that looks normal and convert it to something that looks like it's plus disease while still keeping most of the image the same. And these models are far harder to train here. Um, this took a lot of time, but I had to kind of fiddle around with uh, getting the discriminator and generator to learn at the same rates. So at first I had a problem with the discriminator learning what a plus disease image um, looked like faster than the generator, which basically caused the generator to just give up on trying to produce real images. Um, and it just passed through the same image that it got. And then I had an issue where I finally got to a point where I could get the, the generator learning a little bit faster, but then it was going too fast. And it was learning faster than the discriminator, um, which meant that it would basically create these kind of garbage patterns in here um, that fooled the discriminator into thinking this image was plus disease, even though this retinal vasculature here isn't medically plausible. And then finally, I got to a point where I could develop these retinal um, these, uh, or I could generate these retinal vessel maps that look like they had increased dilation and tortuosity here, but I needed to evaluate that on some models uh, or on a, on a validation data set um, and figure out like, is this actually plus disease or is it only pre-plus disease? So after kind of generating images on our validation data set, I sent those images through the IROP DL system that we have and had it evaluate um, a set of images. And 100% of the images that were um, that were supposed to be converted from normal to plus were diagnosed as plus. And again, 100% of the images that were supposed to be converted from pre-plus to plus disease were also done so. So once I got to this point where I could get 100% of the images uh, in the validation data set being successfully converted, I then evaluated on the test data set. And there's where, um, again, we was able to get 100% of the images con successfully converted from normal to plus disease. And then most of the images, almost 100% of the images converted from pre-plus to plus disease. Now, 
if we take this whole GAN uh, pipeline and put it together, we get some pretty interesting results here. So on the top row, I have uh, two images, two retinal fundus images from two different babies. And then I have, and these babies came in with normal looking vasculature. And eventually each of these eyes here developed plus disease. And then on the bottom row, I have the predictions of what these eyes would look like with plus disease based on these uh, initial images that came through. And what you can see is that there are a lot of similarities here. So you can see that all of a sudden this vessel here, that's also up here, this smaller one, has been predicted to be more dilated and tortuous. And you see that over here. On this image on the right, you still see a lot of the same similarities here where you're getting these dilated and tortuous uh, vessels that are being predicted. But of note, there are some vessels that are being predicted that aren't actually present. So this model is not actually predicting the exact disease appearance, but it is predicting the relative um, disease appearance. So key takeaway here is that we um, can generate these personalized reference standard images that are you know, highly realistic because they're so medically plausible and that experts can't tell the difference between which images are real and which are fake. And we can predict that relative disease severity, which means that we can facilitate the RLP screening exam by those non-experts um, you know, that are performed on these lower risk children. Now, some major limitations here is that this is not going to predict exactly how the disease will present. Um, so that's something that definitely needs to be kept in mind here. And there's obviously a lot more, um, I think some more validation should, should probably go into this. And um, it's also not going to predict the exact disease severity. So if you think back to the one to nine scale that we've talked about, um, I'm just taking an image and making it go from normal to plus, but again, that's, there's that spectrum of disease severity there. So um, it could be that I'm producing images that look like a nine, but plus disease in a baby might only look like a seven, and it could cause a physician not to want to treat. So um, we're also going to look into predicting along that one to nine vascular severity scale there. And then I think another future um, direction here that could be really fun and interesting is synthesizing data sets. Um, and I think this is really important for diseases that are rare or difficult to collect for one reason or another. Um, so we're gonna kind of toy around with that idea moving forward. So ultimately what we've done is we have trained a convolutional neural network to discern between acceptable quality and non-acceptable quality images. And this model can be used for a variety of potential applications. Again, it would be ideal if it could be used right at the bedside, but it can also be used for telemedicine or automated disease diagnosis systems. We've also built a treatment requiring risk model um, that can predict all infants who will develop the disease but also reduce that screening burden by 50% or more. And another key factor here is that this model is highly parsimonious. So, um, you know, it just uses gestational age, which is one of the predictors that we currently use. And then it uses this novel deep learning derived vascular severity score, um, which again, you can just upload a retinal fundus image to a web server and it spits that image out, or it spits that uh, number out for you. And we're even seeing the advent of, you know, uh, uh, retinal fundus camera attachments that can be put on mobile phones. So this is a, becoming like a very viable option uh, for even places that are, um, you know, like developing countries and rural areas. And then finally, we've, in AIM-3, we've uh, trained again pipeline to produce these personalized reference standard images of plus disease so that we can allow um, expert or non-experts to examine our lower risk infants and thus reduce that expert, the RLP expert screening burden and reduce the physiological stress um, on these babies because they don't necessarily need to be screened, you know, once, um, once a week. If they're going by telemedicine, they could be screened, you know, up to two or three weeks instead. Um, so with that, I will happily conclude and open it up to questions. Um, I am interested in any other ideas that you guys might have for um, this GAN pipeline that I've developed too. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. That, that's an excellent talk. Um, any questions from the audience? Either unmute yourself or
type them in the chat, probably simpler um, to unmute. I have a question. It's probably a very simple one. So yep. hi, Aaron, and um, very nice research and presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you use the word instantaneous. And I was wondering if that's because of you modulating the ML pipeline or using a strong framework or kind of both of them. Uh, can you, sorry, clarify instantaneous, where did I say that? So the output of your machine learning, you know, you said it's instantaneous. The uh, physicians need to um, oh. kind of come up with a decision right there and then. Mm -hmm. um, given the trainings that you're doing on these images, um, how fast are we talking about and how how is it possible for it to be that fast? Um, you know, is it your ML pipeline uh, that's making it that fast or a uh, strong framework or other things? Yeah, I think it's just the pipeline. I mean, so are, are you, just to clarify even further, are you talking about a specific aim, like one of the specific aims or um, or just all of them in general? Um, based on your experience, probably all of them, I'm assuming that all of them are fact. Um, yeah. Um, so, like, a big thing is, like, you know, training these pipelines is very, like, GPU intensive and takes a lot, um, you know, of computational power, as I'm sure you know. But um, for doing inference, it's pretty simple now. Um, you know, it can be on a CPU and it, it goes fairly quickly. Um, the quality control model is is very fast um it's like on the order of like if you were to you know ask a logis logistic regression model to perform some get you some sort of output um okay. so this sounds like a framework yeah. and not like something that um comes down to breaking down your ml pipeline and stuff like yeah, that. yeah correct got it awesome thank you so much thank you Any other any other questions? I I, I actually did, I don't have a question either because <laughs> I think you covered it so well. But I I, I actually do want to say that um, I, I'm very um, um, I, I think it's really great that you've taken a very clinical perspective here on you know the, you know you're applying the machine learning. In, in a very specific uh, clinical context, in you know, particular, for example, when we do screening, you know, high sensitivity is is really critical, and um, you know, adapting the machine learning that way um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I saw a question from Nate, but I can't yeah. figure out how to or to see the chat there. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you can um, either you could stop screen sharing, or there is a way to pull it. Oh. Down. I can I ask it. it too. Yeah. No, no, Nate. I just want to read it. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Go for it. Yeah, what was the question? Well, I was just curious if you looked at um, the interpretability of your CNN. Uh, I've, I've read a little bit about like attention maps for trying to interpret these. Um, yeah. Um, I haven't actually. Um, I think a major reason for that, and um, they're definitely like the attention maps, all those things that like look at them. Um, but I think a big problem with them is like you see that a lot of the cases that people like to show in their papers are kind of cherry picked examples where they show you how well it's working and not where it's failing. Um, and there's just a lot of, I think, in my opinion, a lot more work that needs to go into those, um, into interpreting those models, which is a big reason why, you know, for AIM2, I used logistic regression because it was so interpretable, even though you're still using like a deep learning based metric in there like understanding like a vascular severity score, you know, it's a little bit more interpretable than just getting out an answer, right? Yeah, makes sense, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey Aaron, I had a quick question. It was really yeah. great work. Um, I kind of want to follow up on, on Bill's um, comment about clinical context you you showed um the the overall performance on on your test set in terms of prediction i was wondering if you could comment a little bit about uh the confidence in individual predictions i'm assuming there's still a range um yeah and, and that, that would come into play if, if this was used in the clinic 
Yeah, there definitely is going to be, um, and that has to be kind of, uh, you know, we need to work on that a little bit more. Um, but the, the confidence definitely, you start to lose it too, especially what I've noticed is when you have babies who are um, a little bit older and their vascular severity score might be a little bit higher and the model doesn't necessarily, it, they're kind of edge cases there. Um, so that's definitely something that we need to work on or, you know, kind of just examine a little bit further. Great, thanks. Thank you. Hey Aaron, this is Ben. I have a question kind of about, it's maybe more clinical. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the treatments are for um, ROP and what um, in the clinic can be done to slow progression. And specifically if, you know, variations in like standards of care or interventions might impact the utility of your models. Yeah. Um... So the treatments for ROP, there's basically, you can do laser ablation on the vessels that seem like they're kind of growing out of control. So just blast them with a laser and you cause them to scar over. Um, there's also like a cryotherapy, which is similar. You're basically putting like a cold probe on the outside of the eye to freeze those vessels. And then you can also use like an anti-VEGF compound um, to to basically get rid of the VEGF that's in the eye to stop that growing. Um, that has some concerns associated with it because, you know, you're putting anti-VEGF into an eye that should be growing and, you know, it needs to develop. Um, with laser ablation, again, you're, you're destroying that part of the retina. So um, if, you know, if, especially when you're talking about people who maybe over treat, you know, you might be, destroying a part of the retina for a baby that never needed treatment in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, those are kind of some issues to take into account here. Um, and I guess your second part of the question was basically like, how does that factor into the models, correct? Yeah, and I mean, those seem to be kind of maybe approaches to remedy already fairly advanced disease. I, I wonder if, you know, you mentioned, for example, um, the amount of oxygen in the environment being crucial to the development it, of the disease. Yes. You know, I could imagine someone trying to put the eyes in an anoxic environment, right? Like cover the vernix. Yeah. Something. So, I mean, um, that's basically what they're trying to do is they, they try to like finely tune that, that oxygen titration there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of playing this game between, you know, keeping a baby alive and then also not having it develop ROP. I mean, we were, I was literally just talking uh, online with a neonatologist about this yesterday or two days ago, you know, and it's, it's kind of commenting on how it's, it's, you know, you're just towing that line there. So that's really the only uh, thing that we have right now, you know, it's because we know oxygen is what keeps them alive, but figuring out how much is the hard part. And, and so I guess like to kind of wrap up the train of thought, like how does that, um, do you think any of, like, for example, the levels of oxygen, does that influence, like, how um, your models might uh, predict kind of the progression? Yeah, um, there's been some interesting work by actually um, an MD student in our lab who's been looking at basically overall oxygen exposure, you know, up to like 30, 31 weeks of, of uh, like postmenstrual age or whatever. Um, looking at like how, how that affects whether or not you develop treatment requiring ROP. So we're looking at, you know, kind of hoping to add that as actually like another piece in this model to further improve specificity. Awesome. Thanks so much. It was a really fantastic presentation and cool work. Thank you, Ben. Great. Um, I'm going to, um, um, uh, stop it there. Um, so again, thank you for a great presentation. So, um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, 